Welcome to a new edition of Becoming an Ayn Rand Hero, where we use the ideas of Ayn Rand and objectivism to create a life and a lifestyle with the qualities of an Ayn Rand hero, a life that we can't wait to wake up to, in which we live heroic approaches to life. And today is uh, sort of special for me. I get to speak with Professor Stephen Hicks, who I had the pleasure of meeting uh, not too long ago, I had some extraordinary conversations, and uh, whose work I've been following for years. His, his books of uh, Nietzsche and the Nazis, uh, as someone who cares tremendously about the philosophy of Nietzsche, uh, Stephen's work has been uh, enlightening and illuminating. And his book, Explaining Postmodernism, which growing up as a postmodernist, coming out of school as a postmodernist, and thinking of myself as a postmodern socialist, um, his analysis helped me both uh, own and reclaim the value of postmodern thinking and the types of uh, challenges that it represents, and provided a framework in which to understand uh, its role in culture. Among other things, his work with business, business ethics, uh, so Stephen is a professor of business ethics at Rockford University and a longtime objectivist and hero to many of us. So it's a pleasure. Welcome, Stephen. Hey, thanks, Mark. I appreciate the opportunity. Yes, yes. Well, so I, I tend to like to start off the show to get a sense for who you are and how mm -hmm. Ayn Rand fits in your life. How did you encounter Ayn Rand, what was that story? How did she become prominent in your mm. life and thinking? Uh, late teens. Uh, my parents were readers, and so they always had uh, tons of books and they, you know, all around the house, and I was a reader when I was a kid. A uh, couple of things. I remember at one point looking for a book, I think it was during the summer, and Pulling Atlas Shrugged off the shelf and asking my mom about it. And she said, oh, that's a really good book. Uh, but wait a couple of years before you read that one. Um, and so that always kind of stuck with me. Then I uh, finished high school. and I was going on a summer trip. I'd saved up uh, money. I'd always wanted to go to Europe. So I was going. And so my parents took me to Toronto Airport. Uh, to put me on the plane, and my dad asked if I had a book for the plane, and I didn't. So he took me to the bookstore, and just browsing around, and I came across uh, Rand on the shelves. I was looking for something fiction, so I grabbed the Fountainhead, and that summer, uh, I spent a few months in Europe. It was uh, so I have a lot of memories of Europe, but mostly I remember reading <laughs> and rereading Fountainhead about five times. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it, it spoke uh, to you for some for some reason yeah yeah so uh i was you know an, an apolitical person right at that point you know kind of interested in history and ideas but the thing that really grabbed me was the 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 conception of living principled and kind of making a strong commitment to values and following right all the way through right on that so being struck by you know, the the idealism of Rourke, of course the you know, you know the, the petty disgustingness of Peter Keating, <laughs> and and then the very interesting hybrid characters you know Wynand and Dominique and so on. Uh, then that year I started university, and I was starting to read I read Atlas, and I started reading my way through the fiction, but I didn't really yet have a sense of philosophy as a discipline. And actually, I hated my first uh, philosophy course in university. I remember walking out of the exam swearing that I would never take philosophy again. <laughs> Maybe, uh, irony. A, a small irony there. But actually, in my second semester, I took a course in the political science department, and it was taught by a very dynamic professor. Uh, and we were reading, actually, political philosophy primarily. Uh, so we were reading John Locke and Thomas Hobbes and Machiavelli uh, and then Nietzsche, Rousseau and so on. I remember being just fascinated right, with those issues and at that same time I was uh, I think reading Atlas and so it was during that semester that I had a conception about what philosophy was all about as an integrated discipline uh, and that I was fascinated especially by these issues of human nature 
and ethics, not so much the politics, those was uh, the secondary uh, set of issues. Uh, and then I came back as a philosophy major in my second year. So that's my story. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so as a philosophy major in college, mm. familiar with Ayn Rand, reading Atlas Shrugged, I, I'm imagining that there was some sort of cross-pollination between the kinds of issues that you were studying in your philosophy. Sure, yes. And, and, yeah. Yeah, at that point, I wasn't serious about philosophy as a career. I thought I was going to be a, a civil engineer and architect. My uh, my dad was in real estate development, and I kind of thought I would go into business with him. Uh, so I was taking uh, just my kind of liberal arts education for fun. I had a sense my career would be very technical, uh, but I wanted to, as I thought of it, have a kind of a lifetime reading list of the the great books and know what the big issues were and so on. So I was mostly just exploring right through those years. But yes, there was a lot of crossover. Uh, my university in Canada was mostly noted, it was University of Guelph, mostly noted for uh, biological sciences. Uh, but they had a, a, a large philosophy department. They had about 20 professors. Uh, and the it was actually a, a great department for me. As it turns out, the guy who put the department together in the 60s was a skeptic. And he had been basically hired and uh, given a, a, a charge to take a small department and turn it into a large department. So he was kind of had a shopping list. He said, all right, well, I need a, I need a Kantian, I need a Platonist, I need a Papirian, I need a Nietzschean, I need a Marxist. And mm-hmm. so uh, the, uh, the department was very diverse. Uh, and then since the university was primarily a sciences university, there actually weren't very many philosophy majors, so I recall most of my my undergraduate courses were just uh, me and the professor, or me and one other professor. Uh, wow! Would, yeah, it was it was it was awesome. You know, so I had a course on <laughs> on Rawls, and a course on Kant, and a course on Plato, and and so forth. So I've got a very good history of philosophy education. Primarily, it was a matter of you know reading the primary sources, and I would write a paper and meet with my professor for an hour or two in his office, and we would talk and argue about stuff. And then simultaneously, I was also um, uh, reading more in Rand, and she had uh, expressed interest in Mises, so I was reading a lot of Mises, yeah, learning some economics, but uh, interested in his uh, philosophical underpinnings to it, right. uh, and, uh, uh, and so on. I also had to give some credit uh, here to, uh, to Leonard Peikoff, my philosophy courses at the university, well, I took a lot of courses in the history of philosophy that tended to be kind of non-integrative. So I'd have a course on Aristotle's metaphysics, right? And then a course on on Descartes, right? Or whatever. But there was not a, a connection there. But I remember taking by tape, I think it was, uh, Peikoff's history of philosophy course. And so what that did for me was give a sense of kind of the grand sweep of history and then he puts an interpretive framework on it, so you can see it as a series of competing arguments developing over the centuries. And uh, that also was very uh, formative on my thinking. Mm-hmm. Okay, and, and so, uh, thank you. Uh, w- one of the things, I, I, I want to start off with explaining postmodernism, sure. right? As, as an entrance into your work and to the, the way that you think. Yeah. One of the things I appreciated about it, and given the history you just said makes more sense to me, is that you uh, you are not polemic in your style. There are mm. many philosophers, it's like, okay, I have the right answer, and I'm going to show how the other people are wrong, and they offer uncharitable interpretations of the people's work, right? Rather than engage with the actual ideas for what they're worth, Right. And then to bring them out, to find the value in them, but then to find their limitations and to show how they fit in, people just attack. And one right. of the things I uh, enjoy about your work, explain postmodernism, and I know you're working on a new project on liberal capitalism, which uh, also hope hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about, right. is that you that you really attempt to capture the essence of these postmodern thinkers and to. St- to tell the story of what is it that they were bringing, what were the real ideas that they brought, right. and and then how were their limitations in place, and what were the social context? So I'm curious, 
in terms of postmodernism as a movement, how did you get so interested in it? Why do you believe it's important? What do you, what role do you believe it's playing in our current situation? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Small questions, of course. Yeah, that's like you expect three, a lot uh, of them. <laughs> three encyclopedia articles in themselves, right there. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, your first point, right? Methodologically, I think you're right. There's a difference. Uh, this is perhaps uh, a little uncharitable, right, between what I think of as an evangelical mindset, right, and uh, if we stick with the religion analogy, someone who is interested in the study of religion, right, and whether you're religious or not, you have to realize that religion has a lot of deep uh, uh, answers, right, to important questions that human beings who are thoughtful and sensitive grapple with. So whether you agree or not, uh, your operative principle should be to understand right, why people become religious, why they take this road as opposed to that road, or why they say the whole thing I don't think makes sense and become atheist or, uh, or, or agnostic. Um, uh, and so I think in particular, if one is going to become an academic, uh, and if you're going to become an academic who is an educator training young minds, it is a, a responsibility both to yourself and right, to your students in your profession to, uh, to always take the arguments at their best. And religion is hard. I think philosophy is harder. Uh, in many cases, you know, to reach a conclusion, you're integrating an enormous amount of material. So it's understandable that people will integrate it in different ways. Uh, and so you have to be willing to step outside your framework and try to see things from the other person's perspective. So maybe one of the things that was, was useful to me was that, I, uh, as you know, I mentioned before, I had a number of courses uh, just on the major philosophers. So as an undergraduate, I think I developed good skills and a comfort level with being able for a semester to be a Hegelian, right? And to get inside that system and see the whole world the way a Hegelian does, and then the next semester to do it Right from a from a Leibnizian perspective or a Thomist perspective, right or or what? Of course, that's uh, you know difficult because those philosophies are are, are challenging. Um, and in some cases, actually, the, the difficult thing is uh, the way I think of it is finding your way back to reality, right? Because a lot of the uh, <laughs> a lot of the philosophers are in fact you know, very strange, and they will accept some premises, but because of their brilliance, they take them to some very far away, distant from reality places. And if you're taking that project seriously, then you have to go there. Uh, but then you do have to uh, to, uh, to work hard to reorient yourself and when you realize that it's in fact uh, not in connection with, with reality. So postmodernism uh, uh, in particular, I got interested in that in the middle 90s. It was uh, some, years, short, uh, some years, not too many after I finished my PhD work and I became a a full-time uh, professor uh, with a tenure-track position. Um, and up to that point, my philosophy training had been in the history of philosophy, right, as, as I had mentioned. I'd also gotten more interested in political issues. A lot of uh, Cold War issues were looming over everyone's heads during the, uh, uh, during the middle part of the century, kind of my formative years. Uh, and so I do remember reading a lot about Russian history and the history of Marxism to try to understand why right, uh, you know, our more liberal democratic free market capitalist uh, uh, system was on the brink with uh, some very uh, widespread popular, you know, more people were living under communism in the world in the middle part of the 20th century than any other system. So where that came from. So I had a lot of uh, uh, reading in that area, and of course, a lot of my professors in university were left of center, some quite far left. So one always gets a good grounding in uh, in left wing thought if one goes to a to a good university. But for my graduate work, I did mostly uh, work in epistemology, in uh, in logic, in the in the philosophy of science. Um, and a lot of it was from a, kind of an analytical and logical positivistic right, perspective. Mm -hmm. So I actually did not know very much at all about any of the postmodern thinkers, uh, Lyotard, Derrida, uh, Foucault, right, of course, and, uh, and various others. 
until I finished my PhD work. And then I came to Rockford University and I was teaching in the honors program, which was a, a very exciting program, our, our best students. And one of the features of the program was that all of the courses were team taught by uh, professors from different disciplines. Ooh. So I would be uh, teaching a course on whatever with a history professor or a literature professor right, or a sociology professor or whatever. And uh, uh, as I started reading around, I was reading a lot of stuff I hadn't read before. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it, of course, was coming from uh, deconstructionist perspectives or uh, uh, postmodern right perspectives. And the arguments were uh, powerful and persuasive. And the more I surveyed what was going on in the in the professor or in the profession, rather, I realized uh, postmodernism was you know, not just a thing, but a, a big thing and an important thing. So I uh, uh, started then reading quite a lot on the uh, the postmodern thinkers, read most of the French guys, and then realized that they were pointing back to Heidegger and Nietzsche, uh, whom I had some familiarity with right at that point. But they were also pointing back to the later Wittgenstein and some of the pragmatists who I had some familiarity with. Familiar. And all of them were then pointing back to Hegel and to, uh, to Kant. And then I knew that story part uh, very well. So there was a whole epistemological story. Uh, and then I could see it as kind of a two century development right, that was going on there. But then I was also struck by the fact that uh, all of the leading postmodernists were quite far left in their politics. Yes. The, uh, the, uh, the rhetorical uh, arguments were uh, always in the service of certain political conclusions that were coming from a specific part of the political spectrum. So there was a history of philosophy story, there was an epistemology story, there was a politics story. And then I realized uh, this is a very interesting story and <laughs> that I uh, 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 have a great deal of knowledge now about all of three of those stories and that to understand postmodernism really have to know all of the stories because it's not just about epistemology and, and deconstruction. It's not just about politics, right? Uh, um, so out of that came my a series of lectures that I did and then I had my uh, first sabbatical and I... I uh, wrote the book during my sabbatical year, and uh, that's where that came from. Yeah, you, 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 one of the points you make in the book is that uh, if postmodernism were really just a philosophical enterprise, if it wasn't also a political enterprise, if there, if right. there, if there weren't uh, a core political uh, drive behind it, you would expect that some of the philosophers would show up on the left and some would show up on the right and right. but they were that they were universally on the left right that they were yeah in the first generation or two yes dominated right by by the far left and so why that's the case that's a very interesting question yes mm-hmm. <laughs> okay and so as you were doing this you were also familiar with with Ayn Rand and working through Ayn Rand's sure work. so how, how At this did, point, not so much. No, uh, this is now in the 90s. I think I'd done my main reading of Rand about 15 years earlier in my uh, in my student days. Mm-hmm. Well, well, so so when I when I think of you, I think of you as one of the leading lights in Ayn Rand, the philosophical side of Ayn Rand. You could Thank say you. In, in terms of metaphysics, mm. epistemology, ethics, politics, aesthetics, you're your epistemology, your ethics, actually dealing with the real ideas and how she fits into the context mm. of the Western historical tradition. Um, how did, or how did having her uh, philosophy or exposure to it, her metaphysics, her epistemology, influence how you understood postmodernism, or how did your study of postmodern mm. influence how you approached her? Right. I would say, uh, let's see, two things. One, uh, one prominent feature of objectivism is that it is a systematic right, philosophy, and that makes it an outlier in 20th century right, philosophy, much of which has tended to be very um, uh, unsystematic. Now, partly that's driven by the specialization that goes on in scholarly right, discourse, you focus on a fairly narrow right set of issues, and you don't have time or expertise to uh, to deal with the whole 
the whole range. It also was driven by the fact that, uh, particularly in the middle part of the 20th century, philosophy was in a very skeptical place. The uh, kind of the logical positivist program had collapsed by the time we get to the mid 20th century, and so philosophers were largely scrambling around, right, wondering what to do. Uh, uh, that's a little bit uncharitable, but there was a, you know, a strong sense of uh, um, uh, that there, we really don't know right what we are doing. We've reached some very skeptical conclusions about language, about logic, uh, the possibility of uh, uh, values being objective, right, and so on. So uh, Rand then was a strong contrast in that uh, she argues that right, all of philosophy is, is system, systematic and that your politics falls out of your ethics and views of human nature and uh, underlying issues in metaphysics and epistemology. So I think I uh, absorbed that when I was uh, younger and that, that stuck with me. And I think that's a, a true right and an important thesis uh, that if you just carve off one issue in philosophy and try to just work on that in isolation, you can't really do it and you can't really do it very well. You typically then get uh, caught up in snarls, and uh, uh, the snarls are typically driven by when you tried to carve off that one subsection of philosophy, you are uh, buying into a whole lot of assumptions that uh, then you are just taking for granted. But if you don't eventually make those assumptions explicit uh, uh, and ground them and argue for them, you're not going to be able to make progress. So uh, that stuck with me. Of course, the, the other thing was uh, Rand's strong advocacy of uh, reason and rationality, that things ultimately right, make sense, uh, things have an identity that plays out in, in causal form, and of course the world is very complex, so there are very uh, complicated causal stories that we have to tell. Um, and that, what that means though is even when one is dealing with things that seem highly irrational, uh, uh, an unsystematic and crazy and postmodernism in some of its manifestations certainly goes down that road. But there nonetheless is a story that makes sense for how that particular form of irrationality right, came about. So when you have a big sprawling movement like postmodernism, which has something to say about literature, something about history, about law, about the arts, right, about philosophy and so on, that if you work at it, uh, even though it bills itself as kind of anti-rational, anti-systematic, uh, you can eventually understand why that uh, unsystematic or anti-rational way of looking at the world uh, has so much influence in so many different disciplines. So methodologically, I think that was helpful to me as well. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Postmodernism sometimes talk about the narrative, right? The framework right. through which you're interpreting, which has right. a profound impact on how you interpret, and this idea of a meta narrative. Yes. That can there be uh, one narrative that holds the other narratives? This system that Ayn Rand is suggesting to, to right. suggest that right. there is a meta narrative in which all of the pieces fit and make sense right. is right. extraordinarily provocative. I'm I I look out into the world of philosophy, I don't find anyone but Ayn Rand who is bold enough to make that kind of suggestion, it seems. Well, she is. Uh, she was an outlier, certainly, in the, the middle part of the 20th century, right, when, when she was active. Uh, the philosophy profession is, I think, more healthy now. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk more about that later, uh, uh, if you want. Um, <clears throat> and there are uh, people who are more are comfortable with broader theories in, uh, in applied ethics, in, in meta-ethics. I think cognitive science is a very exciting area right now, and people are are uh, starting to talk about truth again. So uh, already the, the language of narrative, of course, right, that comes primarily out of the world of fiction. And it's easier to talk about narratives than it is to talk about theories and truth, because right? the idea of a narrative is uh, you're telling a story, and you're more interested in the story being more internally coherent and hanging together. Uh, and whether it's true or not is uh, kind of a supplemental supplemental feature. So the narrative language already is a retreat, right, uh, philosophically from talking about theories and whether the theories are true or not. 
But it makes sense that once you start talking about narratives uh, and you're more interested in the rhetorical power of the stories that we are telling, uh, then uh, the idea of a meta narrative is going to even seem more distant. Right? That somehow there's right one overall story that fits all of the stories. Well, you're just you're not going to buy into that. And so, yeah, Leotard's phrase sticks right with many people. Right? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, so to to continue down this road, go into your work on philosophy of education. Sure. Right, because you've 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 done an enormous amount of work on it. But by the way, your the, the lectures that you have online or the the videos that you have online, where you go through topics just sort of systematically with your whiteboard, mm -hmm. and you just just brilliant thank you it was a to, very fun project yeah to, to, to watch you think through the issues define the terms bring them mm -hmm. together relate them together put them in an arc um hi highly recommended to my listeners <laughs> right? you will always you will always come out smarter Good, after, thank you after thank after you. so the in contemporary education in contemporary colleges there's this large movement about um, I, I consider it language policing mm. but there's microaggressions and safe spaces and uh, an, an enormous sensitivity to uh, dominant marginalized languages and cultures and, and people's place in them right how do you see that unfolding and relating to philosophy and what does Ayn Rand have to say of just Oh. Well, again, these small questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd say right now we are, uh, with respect to that phenomenon, that's third generation postmodernism. Uh, so what you have in the first generation postmodernism is some high theory. Right? You have a large number of people who are very well educated. Uh, one of the striking things, for example, about the leading postmodernists Richard Rorty, uh, uh, Leotard, Derrida, Foucault, and so on, is that all of them are uh, philosophy PhDs, and all of them in their graduate school are getting at very good schools in Europe and the United States, a first-rate education in epistemology. And it's the, really the rigor and depth of their understanding of where epistemology is at a very skeptical moment that gives them the power and the stature, right, that they have. So what you then have is a movement that says, okay, we, we can't know the truth, right? In fact, we should really just stop talking about truth, that there maybe are truths, and so we relativize the concept of truth, or we take the notion that truth really is a subjective, right, uh, projection, right, on a possible reality, right, that is, that is out there. Um, and that is integrated then with the politics, right? because all of the leading uh, postmodern thinkers in the 50s and 60s, when they're coming of age, they are young men and young women. All of them are uh, Marxist or very close to right, being Marxist. And what the Marxism then uh, adds is this strong adversarial stance toward the world, uh, an adversarial stance toward what's taken to be the dominant culture, uh, a breaking down of culture into subcultures, uh, each of which has its own, so to speak, narrative that's in competition and contradiction to the narratives right, of uh, other elements of culture. But since we are skeptical, uh, we don't think that rationally we can sit down and have a good discussion and work out what the truth is. So instead, all we have is people strongly committed to contradictory value systems and then no possible way of rationally right, reconciling them. Right. Okay, so that's first generation, right, postmodernism. Um, and then uh, as that then gains more adherence, right, among young people who then are university educated, they then, some of them become uh, professors themselves in the next generation, or they go on to careers in, uh, in intellectual life or in the arts community and become uh, uh, influential there. Right, one way that comes out is, uh, is in saying that, well, if we are skeptical, right, nobody really knows the truth, 
Uh, but there are dominant narratives, and then there are weaker narratives that are marginalized. Then what we should do is, and this would then be a second generation thing, is push for a kind of equality. Right? That there's no narrative that is truer or better than any other narrative. That's what the first generation teaches us. So the second generation concludes that all narratives are equal. And so what we need to do is make uh, equal space in the curriculum uh, for all narratives. Right? And so that then means, you know, if you say we're going to have the students read, I'm just making up a number here, right, 100 books uh, uh, over the course of their university career. Right now, right, 80 of those books are written by dead white European males, right, for example. And uh, only a minority uh, right, of the books are being are written by uh, women, members of racial minorities, ethnic minorities, right, and so on. So in the name of uh, a kind of diversity, equality, fairness, and so on, uh, what we should do is have a more equal representation of all voices right across the curriculum. And the way that plays out is a, a kind of affirmative action then for, for books. Right? So then you say, uh, if uh, you know forty percent of the population uh, is uh, is white males, then maybe forty percent of the books would, should be written by white males. And if uh, you know seventeen percent of the population is Hispanic, then we should have seventeen percent representation, right? And so on. So we're going to go for some kind of equality or or uh, uh, proportional representation. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you see that uh, uh, manifesting itself starting in the late 80s on through the 90s, early right 2000s, right, and so on. By the time we get to the uh, third generation, the last 10 years or so, that then starts to shift uh, for, for a couple of reasons. One is that you then get, uh, just demographically, a higher percentage of people who are now professors whose careers are based on teaching the previously underrepresented right, books in the curriculum. And so that's what they know, that's what they're interested in, that's what they think is you know, true right, and or important. So they're interested in further uh, advancing you know, the course of those books and those ideas right, in, uh, in their curriculum. And they're not that interested right, in teaching the other traditions and the other perspectives. Uh, some of them are, of course, uh, just ideological teachers and not really right, professors in the, in the best sense of the word. But also, and this is a, perhaps a, a, an Ayn Rand uh, insight, and uh, uh, behind her a Nietzschean right insight, that one of the uh, uh, the things that the, the, uh, those who are on the weaker side, those who think they've been alienated right and oppressed right, learn to do, because of a certain uh, uh, kind of altruism. We can talk more about altruism and its uh, its very uses there, though. Is that what we need to do is not uh, push for a kind of equality between strong and weak, rich and poor, powerful and powerless, but rather give special preference right, to those who are on the losing end of various social forces, right, so to speak. That we should actively uh, sacrifice the stronger for the sake of the weaker, sacrifice the richer for the sake of the poorer. Uh, sacrifice the oppressors, right, and then on behalf of the of the oppressed. And what this then means is that uh, uh, we get away from equality as the standard to a kind of uh, compensatory justice, right, as the standard. Where if you think that the rich and the powerful and the smart and the strong have been using their uh, advantage, right, position to damage, harm the interests of the weaker then it's perfectly fine to sacrifice uh, the stronger for the sake of the, of the weaker. And once the, uh, those who are in the weaker alienated position right, realize that they, so to speak, have this tool right, or weapon right, at their disposal, that they are owed, right, and that people uh, who are in the, the advantage groups feel guilty because they've been taught to feel guilty right, about all of the advantages right, that they have, this becomes a very powerful tool for leveraging your position right, within the institution. Right? So then you can start saying, no, it's not just the case that uh, uh, you know, we can't say that conservative voices and liberal voices are, are, are equal. They're all just narratives. And so 
we should have equal space. We say, no, no, the conservative voices have been dominating in our culture, and so it's time for them to shut up for a while, and we're only going to hear voices right from our right side of the equation. Uh, and it's not just as a matter of, hey, let's, let's do this in, in fairness and make up for past sins, but you see it coming out in the particularly aggressive and ugly form right, that it does. You, know, you owe us, and uh, anything that you say because of your group membership is just uh, evil, depraved, and we can just shut you up by any means, right, fair or foul. It's, uh, an ex- it, it's an expression of your privilege. Yes, that's and, right. So, and you so, must check your privilege. You must... Sure. That's question, right. use the guilt that you're talking about yes, to question right. your own thinking and your own right to speak it. Right. Right. And so it's, uh, th- those who have privilege, they don't have equal rights anymore. In fact, they, uh, they should just shut up and go away and be silenced. Uh, and that, of course, is a power play. But to the extent that it works, it means that uh, your side then has more control over, over the institution, whatever institution you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with what's going on with Jordan Peterson. I'm imagining since you're from Toronto, you may be familiar with it. Are, are, is that? Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I think uh, I think highly of the stance right that he is taking. Right, you know, that's a you know a complicated set of issues in one sense. Um, you know, there the local debate is over pronouns, and we've been having arguments about pronouns, his, her, their, right, and so on for uh, for a couple of generations now. Um, you know, and, and part of this is a matter of uh, how in language with language evolving, uh, but also we take people's uh, quest for personal identity seriously and we want people to explore and become themselves. And so for a long time, it's been a matter of, um, you, know, you know, some sensitivity to make sure that the pronouns we're using aren't in fact presupposing that there's only one gender, that we're, we're being inclusive and so when appropriate, Use his, her, his or her, right, or or whatever. Zir or zir or. Well, that's yeah, that's the the more recent variations on that, and it's also uh, you know part of the package of civility to uh, to respect people's claim about how they would like to be referred to, you know. So you know, I always think back when kids, you know, you know, suppose your name is James, right, but. Uh, when you were a kid, you were called by your parents, Jimmy, right? And so for 10 years, 12 years, they've been calling you Jimmy, but now you are become a teenager and you don't really feel like a Jimmy anymore. That sounds too childlike. You want to be Jim, right? Or you want to be James. Um, you have to say, all right, well, okay, now we can change our habit and respect his desire to be called this other name. Or people might more dramatically say, I don't like my given name. I'd rather be called by my middle name, right, or something. So we're sensitive to that, and that all seems uh, very fine and healthy. But of course, it should be done um, civilly. Uh, so demanding, right, that people just call you your preferred thing is uh, already a, a retreat from civility. And that should be a two-way street, that you also have to respect the other person's uh, context and what uh, kind of linguistic framework they are operating right within. So uh, this you know, may be a bit of a, a dig here, but I always think, for example, of um, you know, many religious leaders right, who give themselves very exalted right, names right, or old-fashioned aristocrats. Right? You may, you'll have to refer to me as your worship right, or your, your, uh, your highness right, or your, your exaltedness right, and so on. Uh, and so kind of demanding that other people buy into your linguistic framework and say, no, no, you have to call me you know, exalted one, right? Uh, that's a little bit presumptuous, right, with respect to the other person's framework. So there should be a, a civil give and take, and people should be able to work out something that uh, that respects both parties' uh, interests. So I think what uh, 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 Professor Peterson is doing well uh, is he's saying, of course, I'm open to calling people by their preferred pronoun, but that should be a, a request rather than a demand. And it should be something that uh, comes out of a discussion, right, with the person, not an immediate presumption that that person is evil and wicked for not automatically adopting your preferred linguistic framework. Um, And that uh, on issues where there is controversy, right, you know, like people's gender identities and all of the biology and psychology and politics that's wrapped up in that, 
that uh, you can't simply demand right that your preferred psychological, biological, and political framework be the only one allowed in the conversation, and that you're going to use kind of linguistic power plays to shut up the opposing perspectives. Those are the things we need to argue about, right, in a free speech civil environment, right, and not make demands. Well, so so I, I applaud him for pushing on those points. Yeah, thank you. Where do you see this going? You, 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 uh, Rockford perhaps isn't one of the most politically correct schools in the nation. Right. Right. It's not Brown. But yeah, wh- where, where, yeah, where, do, where a, do you see right, things middle going? Of the country, middle of the road institution, yes. Sorry, yeah. I didn't hear that. Yeah. So, so wh- wh- where is it do you think things are going in terms of the arc of this conversation and where it leads? And Yeah. Well, yeah, you're asking me to uh, do crystal ball gazing. Um, and so I'm, I'm not someone who predicted that Donald Trump would win. So maybe uh, I. <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's fine. We've got. We've yeah, got... So uh, take my take my predictions with a grain of salt. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't think anybody knows. Right. Uh, I think these things are right, always pr- unpredictable, uh, partly because the philosophical issues that underlie all of it are very complicated. And there's no way of predicting right which set of arguments right are going to prevail. When you leave this, this strictly po- political or pho- philosophical arguments are all kinds of uh, psychological factors and social psychological factors, and cultural factors and uh, uh, international factors that say what issues are important in any given generation's uh, thinking right about uh, what uh, what uh, should be thought, what values are important, and what uh, what should be done. So let me uh, just speak from my my my, the, my narrower perspective, which is a philosophical perspective and a philosophical perspective inside of the academic world, right? Broadly speaking, mm-hmm. now I would say one sign of hope is that while all of the arguments that are prevalent and now being deployed actively in university campuses and in the cultural circles more broadly, they're all philosophical, right? In their origin. And they get played out, right, and applied in all of these uh, subcultural areas. Um, that philosophy, to a large extent, has moved on, right? So philosophy does, even when it goes through its skeptical moments, nonetheless have built into it a pro-reason methodology, right, to a large extent. That we philosophy tends to attract people who like argument, like looking at things at, at, at different perspectives, and they are really interested in truth, uh, even if you know, the line of argument they follow leads them to the conclusion that truth is uh, is not possible. But what has happened in the philosophy profession is, you know, the philosophy profession will follow the arguments of the really smart people to their bitter end and reach various skeptical movements. And then uh, grope around for five, ten years or so, and then some other smart person comes along with another really interesting argument, and then everybody will go to work on it, trying to defend it, trying to tear it down. And typically, it has some flaws, and so it gets torn down eventually. And we grope around for a while, but then somebody else comes up with another one, and that's what has happened in the philosophy profession uh, since the 1960s and the 1970s, which were uh, quite skeptical right moments. Uh, Quine was dominant, Thomas Kuhn, right, was dominant, Paul Feyerabend, right, was uh, prominent, right, and so on. Uh, uh, and then on the continental tradition, Heidegger uh, and Nietzschean philosophy and the postmodernists are all gathering steam. But since then, um, uh, there's been a lot of very good work done uh, in the history of philosophy. Uh, there's been a resurgence of interest in most of the major uh, thinkers in philosophy, and the history of philosophy almost always proceeds on the assumption that uh, you know what the philosopher said, uh, he or she said what he or she said. The text is there. There is a better and worse way of interpreting the text, and so uh, all of the greats then are rediscussed, and we have uh, very sophisticated arguments right about them. There's been a, a movement uh, to take applied ethics very seriously. So there's a lot of very interesting work being done in business ethics, engineering ethics, 
medical ethics, right, and so on, and all of that right, proceeds on the assumption that uh, human beings, for example, have real biological natures and real medical needs, and, uh, and it's important for us to figure out what these are. Uh, there was a big boom and continues to be a big boom of interest in philosophy of mind among philosophers and working uh, systematically with people in the other cognitive science disciplines, the brain scientists, right, the linguists, the linguists rather, the, uh, the psychologists, right, and so forth, because we really want to figure out how the mind works. And the assumption there is that, you know, psychology and language are real disciplines and biology is real, right, and so on. So uh, there are a lot of skeptical things going on in philosophy right, right now, but a lot of very healthy and very interesting things right, that are going on as well. So one thing then you might then say is, uh, uh, to the extent that inside the academic world, those issues attract smart young people who say, I actually want to work on something interesting, uh, on something that's going to go somewhere, that uh, uh, young people will be more attracted to those interesting issues and they won't be attracted to the implications of the skeptical uh, issues as well. The other thing I would say, uh, I don't know, I've been saying this for, <laughs> I guess, almost 15 years now, so maybe uh, I should back off on it. But you know, once you reach postmodernism um, with its uh, skeptical, highly subjectivistic, highly uh, conflict mode of uh, social interaction, there's not really anywhere to go right after that. Right. So once you say, you know, we don't know anything, right? Everything's just a subjective projection. Well, then, okay, we don't know anything, right? So what do we do next, right? Well, there's nothing more to say, right? Or everything's just a subjective projection, right? Okay, well, then that's just your subjective projection. Projections, I'm not really that interested in talking with you anymore, right? So um, it becomes boring, right, very quickly. Uh, and when you're dealing with smart people with active minds, they don't like to be bored. And so I, I've been sensing this, and you do start to see this in the literature, that people are seeing that a lot of the postmodern arguments are retread, right? revariations and restatements of things that they've been hearing now for quite a while, and it's just not that interesting, right, anymore. Mm -hmm. So it might have a lot of cultural traction still, mm -hmm and some institutional power because it's entrenched among uh, uh, much of the professoriate, but uh, uh, people could get bored and moved on. At least that's my, that's my hope. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, so the, let, let's have that lead into the, the question of applied ethics and business ethics. Sure. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, you, you could say that that's where your professorship is. Uh, you 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 work as in in business as ethics. Yeah, it's you, one of the courses that I teach uh, regularly. I'm a professor yeah. of philosophy, but uh, yeah, I I uh, uh, it, uh, do teach you, let, let, or too. Per, per, perhaps it's an uncommon specialty. Okay. And 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 you've written a number of articles on it. You've been published in different pieces. You've published your own pieces on it. Um, I I'm particularly interested in business ethics. Uh, from a, from a number of perspectives, especially the practical ability to create a business that works long term. Mm. Uh, when I uh, again, when I came out of college, I was a postmodern socialist, and uh, I was passionately in, in my graduate. I was in graduate uh, organizational development, clinical psychology, and I was passionately deconstructing, kind of across the board. And then I came across Ayn Rand, and she kicked my but, and, and I became interested in business. Business went from being the tool of the evil p people in power who use their money and uh, access to resources, these capitalists and landlords who are dominating society, sure. into entrepreneurs who are creating new products and providing win-win solutions. And that, and that right. fundamentally changed not just how I understood the world, how I understood my life, but how I lived my life, mm -hmm. the kinds of relationships I build, the kind of businesses I build, who, who I work with. What's it like to be in that arena? What's the hope of it? How does Ayn Rand play into that? Right. 
Well, in your first point, uh, if you look at business uh, sociologically, I mean, there is a lot of truth to the uh, the crony capitalist narrative because we do have a huge number of them. And I would say in the last generation, we have more more of them. Right, those who do uh, use their access to political power uh, at the local, state, and federal level to uh, line their own pockets at the expense right of uh, of everyone else. There always are in the business world, right, people who do see it as a zero-sum game and whose strategy is uh, to be very sophisticated at exploiting other people and defrauding them. So uh, you can always find, right, a, a number of people, right, who are that way. Right, but of course, that's uh, uh, leaves out what's probably the most important uh, uh, number of people in business and the people who really matter and those who are genuine value creators, right, the ones who... Sometimes they start their own business and they uh, they provide a new service and new value uh, that uh, that uh, adds to lots of people's lives, uh, and we should be celebrating those people or even people who work well within existing organization creatively. They work hard. They're adding value, right, and so on. And in many cases, uh, in the business ethics literature, uh, they have been kind of the unsung and often even unnoticed, right, people in the literature. Instead. The first generations of the business ethic literature, especially and certainly business ethic literature in the popular press, typically focuses on on the scandals, right? On uh, on the bad guys. You know, partly that's a matter of you know just the journalistic dynamic. You know, bad news sells, the scandal sells, and so scandals and bad news in the business world is more likely to get get uh, noticed. In one way, it's not that sexy, right? The idea of uh, being a responsible person and getting up and going to work in the morning and just getting the job done. Right? Millions of people do that, so uh, it's not especially right newsworthy. But uh, when one starts looking uh, outside of the popular press and into the more serious right, academic press, it is true that the business ethics profession in the first generation or two of its existence was you know, reflective of the broader intellectual climate, and it had a an anti-business ethic. It did see business as a zero-sum game, business ethics as a an oxymoron, right, or a contradiction in terms. Uh, it was drawing on some kind of very deep philosophical resources that says, uh, you know, concerns with money and profit are of a lower order, and if you're a good person, you should be kind of non-materialistic or interested in higher things. Or that nice guys finish last, and that if you really are going to be successful in the business world, you have to be a kind of bastard and and be willing to screw people over or to get ahead. And so all of those analyses would, in uh, in various ways, feed into what business ethics saw itself as as doing. Um, now there has been a I wouldn't say a sea change, but there has been a significant minority movement now within the business ethics literature, just in the last maybe 10 years where people are taking value creation more seriously, right? So when, for example, right, we look at the companies that are in the Fortune 500 right now, the top, say, 500 companies in the United States, and we look at how many of them existed 30 years ago or one generation ago, and we realize that it's really only a minority of them. So where did all of these big, huge companies come from? Uh, and we realized that all of them started as entrepreneurial, right, small firms, a couple of guys in a garage, right, and or or uh, or their basement, right, or or, or whatever. So people uh, realize that you know all of the wealth that is out there. And I'm overstating to some extent, saying not all people, but a significant minority of people in the business ethics profession that. This story that somehow there's just a certain amount of wealth, that there are just all these corporations out there that are dominating the landscape and they're kind of redistributing existing wealth around, but that's not the true story. That We have to understand that some people figure stuff out, that they come up with ways of producing new things that add a huge amount of value. And so there is more interest in, in uh, value creation. Uh, understanding entrepreneurship right as a as a phenomenon. Um, the other thing I would say about the business ethics profession is that it started to I would say professionalize itself in the last fifteen years or so. Uh, when I started doing business ethics, uh, uh, most of the people who were doing business ethics were philosophers who didn't actually know very much about business, right They had never run a business. 
most of them had been good students and gone straight through their PhDs and they got interested in business ethics for whatever reason. Uh, and they might have had a theoretical, uh, idealized, ethical understanding of what business should be. And they were just interested in applying that right in their in their disciplines. They didn't necessarily have an MBA. Uh, and so a lot of it, frankly, was just awful, right? Uh, awful. Uh, <laughs> Uh, normative uh, normative theorizing in the worst sense, but that has uh, changed a lot. What we're starting to see now, particularly in, in younger people, is a lot of people who at least got an MBA, right, and so they at least have some theoretical understanding of business, right, or uh, they worked for a while uh, and then got a philosophy degree, and so they've got some practical experience, right, or not. Or a lot of people who uh, who went the other way, they got the MBA, they got the work experience, and then they got very interested in business ethics and so got a master's degree in philosophy or a PhD in philosophy. So I think that the field is slowly professionalizing itself. And so it's uh, still, I think, dominated by people who are not necessarily anti-business, but uh, who see business as in itself kind of amoral, but it can be redeemed in various ways. Uh, but I'm part of a, I think, I like to think of it as a kind of growing vanguard. minority of people who see, sorry. A vanguard. Uh, okay, there's a good word. <laughs> yes, we'll take Lenin's phrase. Yes. <laughs> the vanguard of the entrepreneur. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, who uh, see business as uh, kind of inherently a, a positive force, as a, an inherently healthy force. Uh, that you're interested in. Uh, you know, taking charge of your life, making your life into what you want, and your business career, whatever field that is, as the vehicle or one of the primary vehicles in your life by which you're going to realize that. And and how does how do you understand Ayn Rand's philosophy fitting into uh, yeah. the business ethics as you understand it? You could, you Fair enough. It. Yeah, <clears throat> I wrote one piece now when I started getting interested in uh, this phenomenon of uh, uh, business ethics from an entrepreneurship angle. Uh, much of the, the literature has been dominated by uh, a model called corporate social responsibility, where the assumption is that we, we do business ethics, we study corporations, typically mature corporations, and we study them in terms of what they owe to society, right, in various ways. Uh, and I thought that was a limited model for a number of reasons that when you do business ethics, you should start where business begins, and business always begins with entrepreneurship, right? Someone has an idea and starts a business. And then, of course, uh, if you're successful, you might grow your business into a mature corporation, but that's a derivative later organic development, right, that comes out of a more under, or more fundamental understanding of where business comes from. So that then raises the question of, uh, you know, where do these new businesses come from? And the people who start them, what kind of people are they? Uh, and so I started uh, studying a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of the psychology literature uh, on entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, I started doing a lot of uh, interviews myself with uh, with entrepreneurs uh, trying to get inside their heads and seeing right, what they what they tick uh, and drawing on other people's studies and my own studies i came up with a list of what i think of as uh, success traits right for being an entrepreneur right? so if we think of a somewhat idealized entrepreneur what kind of a person do you need to be to make a go right of that that process and you say well Obviously, you have to uh, have some creative ideas, right? So you have to have a certain mindset, right? Not just waiting for other people to tell you what you are supposed to do. Uh, you are the one who's going to come up with an idea. So a certain mindset is there. You have to be a person then who has some initiative, right? Uh, the entrepreneur is a, is a self mover, uh, rather than just saying, well, it's a nice idea, but then not doing anything right with it. I'm actually going to, to, uh, to act on the idea. Uh, almost all entrepreneurs uh, talk a lot about fear, right? I have to give up my job with its steady income. So there's a fear of, uh, of uh, not being able to pay the bills. The fear of failure. How do I know this idea is, is going to be successful? Most entrepreneur you know, ventures we know uh, fail right, uh, several times. Uh, I might look like an idiot, right? My, my spouse and my friends you know, might uh, laugh at me, right, and so on. So this whole issue of dealing with all of the fears, right, that go into entrepreneurship, you have to have some you know, fear 
tolerance, right, and so on. Now, if we just you know pause right there at the very early stages, already we're talking about a certain kind of cognitive mindset, what I think of as kind of a creative rationality, right, that you have to have in place, being playful with ideas and really studying ideas. Uh, but that tracks on to right uh, uh, the virtue, right, of being a rational person, right, being committed to looking through your own eyes at the world, seeing what's good, what's bad, what can be improved, imagining alternatives, and so on. And so that tracks very nicely on to the objectivist virtue of right, rationality. If you talk about the person who says, well, I've got a nice idea, uh, but I, you know, I, I change the channel and right, or, or do something, I don't actually act on the idea. No, I have an idea and I'm going to act on it. I'm going to put into practice what I think is true, important, worth doing, and so on. That tracks very nicely onto the virtue of integrity, right? because integrity as an overarching virtue is to say, I think this is true, and that's what I'm going to live, right? uh, or I'm, my, my actions are going to be integrated with my beliefs about what's true and important. So if I think I have a, a really good business idea that will make my life better, then I act on that idea. And so that entrepreneurial trait also factors in. If you're talking about people who are uh, aware of risks and dangers and the possibility of failure and the natural fears that come with that, but say, okay, I still think this is a good idea and it's an important idea, so I am, despite my fears, right, going to do what I think I need to do, then you're talking about the virtue of courage. Right? And uh, courage, of course, also maps on nicely into the uh, objectivist right list of virtues, right, and so on. Anyway, that's a short story. Yeah, just, and, uh, and, 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 free to, right and, off and, that. and to be able to risk other people's judgment of your failure. And yes. To, that right. maps on to in, independence, independence as, as, perfect. as, as you're saying okay. this. It's like... So you're nicely, yeah. uh, you're nicely anticipating right where I want to go. Yeah. Or the virtue of pride, which uh, Rand characterizes as a kind of uh, ambitiousness, right? a moral ambitiousness, wanting your life to be the best that it can be, right? Well, that again is very entrepreneurial, because entrepreneurs want to make their lives, their business careers the best they can be, but of course they have that typically nested in a broader vision of they want a certain lifestyle that they think is going to be right best for them. Uh, you know, this, uh, this idea, uh, also entrepreneurs typically take very seriously uh, they want to be compensated well for the value that they know that they are adding to other people's lives. They know that their product or service is good. Right? Think about you know, Reardon Metal and Reardon's uh, unwillingness to sell it right, at the point of a gun, right, so to speak. He right? says, so, you know, I know this is good, right? okay. and uh, I'm going to get, I want to be compensated, but I want to be compensated on my terms. Right? Uh, but the flip side of that is your awareness that other people who are using your product, that it's actually adding value to their life um, and liking the fact that you are adding value to their life. So most entrepreneurs will say they get a real charge right, out of you know, seeing, right, say, somebody wearing the clothes that they designed right, or using a device, right, or a program or an app, right, that they designed and so on. So that they, they recognize that there's a trade, right, that has been built into what they have done. And that they are, as a result of their value creation, uh, receiving great compensation, but the other person is also receiving great compensation or great uh, value value. And so uh, that, I think, maps onto a kind of justice, right, that... Uh, you know, if we think about justice in this in, in this uh, narrower sense, it's a matter of all of the parties, so to speak, uh, get what they deserve, right? And both parties, uh, in an ideally just situation, walk away ahead, right, from a from a transaction. So, the customer adds value to my life if I'm the entrepreneur, uh, in proportion to the, the amount that I have added value to that person's life, and so it's a mutual win-win. And both sides of that transaction, uh, both of us being treated as we deserve, right, matters. Right? And that's a kind of justice as well. And that also maps on to right, objectivism well. So if you take uh, you know, the, the core list of uh, objectivist virtues, uh, seven or so, uh, 
uh, depending on fine-tuning ways, which ones you, you emphasize. Uh, there are very tight connections to kind of the entrepreneurial set of traits that enables people to be, to be successful. More broadly, you can think of uh, you know, objectivism as uh, an entrepreneurial philosophy. You know, if you think of the value philosophy, it really is encouraging you to be the entrepreneur of your life, right, so to speak, to say, you know, this is my life. Uh, what do I want to make of it? And it really is mine to make of. And I need to think of all of my options and be creative and persevering and and all of those things that entrepreneurs have to do to, to, uh, to see your whole life as a kind of a grand entrepreneurial venture. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank so, you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, um, the show is called Becoming an Ayn Rand Hero. Mm. Right. And, and, it's, and it's about... How how are you going to live your life? Sure, you know, right. Uh, of yeah, what so you that get? high romanticism that's also built into Rand, that uh, almost aesthetic, right? Uh, sense that your life can be wonderful and beautiful that uh, most of us have when we are kids, uh, hopefully, mm -hmm. uh, right? Never losing that, right? Uh, uh, as one grows to maturity and life gets hard and complex. Yes, and and. Uh, in in the five tier model of metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, politics, aesthetics. Yes, right? very good. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think of the Ayn Rand hero as exemplifying the virtues, but the the entrepreneur, the the Ayn Rand hero, someone who wants to make their life, their business, something that they're glad to wake up to, that they can yeah. have moral pride about. That, that's beautiful, because. Yeah. They're following their truth, and they're working with other people to help them live great lives too, such that they can take joy in the success of the people they're interacting with. Absolutely. When, yeah. when I think about Atlas Shrugged, you know, I think about the valley. I think about how when Dagny and Hank are negotiating the cost of Reardon Metal. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, right. And and, right. and they are they're ruthless in that sense. Yeah. Right? But they're having so much fun and there's so much respect and they understand that this traction this interaction must be win win in order for it to work, in order for both of us to thrive. And it's the fact that they're they're playing so hard with one another. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, that uh, uh, dichotomy often between work and play completely gets broken down, right, uh, uh, in that scene. And, of course, Rand is having fun with it as a novelist as well. Uh, but that, uh, the point you're making, and you're saying it very well, uh, is exactly the thing that uh, business ethics needs more of, right? Because uh, you know, we, uh, for various reasons, you know, actually deep cultural reasons, deep philosophical reasons, have very entrenched right, notions that work is one thing, that work really is a duty and obligations, a drudgery right, that you have to do, and that play is something else. Right? And that's a very dehumanizing right, model of work. If you think about the many sad stories, you know, millions of people, even in our you know, free entrepreneurial society to a large extent, who uh, you know, they do hate their jobs, right? they, they feel locked in you know they have phrases of, i'm just working for the weekend right or the idea is that for five days i don't get to be me i just have to do what the man tells me and go to this job that i hate but then two days out of the week then i get to uh, to be me right the weekend uh yeah so this this idea of seeing your career as something fulfilling creative uh, that uh, that you can make your own right whether you start your own business or, or go to work for someone else uh, that that uh, your work is an important, fundamental part of your humanness, right? who you are, and you should make it in your own self-image. Uh, yeah, that that needs to be pushed a lot harder. Yeah, that 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 choice to make your work part of your aesthetics, an expression of yes. of beauty. Yeah, in, I, I I I give each of these five levels. I give them. Uh, words that begin with R to yes, kind of make I, them me yes. memorable. And, and the R for, for aesthetics is realization. It's to realize your vision of what's possible, and which means that you have to have a vision 
right. of what's possible. And when you and when you align your life, when you align your work, and you say, okay, I'm going to wake up today. I'm going to be doing a, a number of things. I'm going to do them in a way that I make them beautiful, that are yes. an expression of what I believe to be beautiful. So you are a kind of artist. Yes. Yes, and, 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 and I believe when I look at all of Ayn Rand's heroes, they're all artists in that sense. Sure. Yeah. They, they're all, they see something that's possible, something that inspires them, a creation right. that will require of them their best, right? Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and, and let's hope it requires your best. And, and, and in fact, if the goal I'm seeking does not require my best, I'll increase the goal. Good. That means yeah. that, that that means that there's more than I can do. And when I think of entrepreneurs and business business ethics, if there's anything we could promote around business, mm-hmm. it's this vision that you can create something great with what you're doing. Yeah. You know. Uh, it, it, I'll, I'll say one more one more thing. At the Go beginning ahead. of at the beginning of Atlas Shrugged. In the, in the in the first scene, we meet uh, Eddie Willers, and he's walking through New York, and and it's broken down. You know, mo- many of the shops are closed, but he sees he as he's looking, he sees a bus expertly steered. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And and that yeah. that that premonition. Of, of something that matters, something done well. It doesn't matter what it is that you're doing. If you really focus on what it is you're doing, the reality of it, and you use reason and you, and you have integrity, you take responsibility, and you treat people with respect, you can make something beautiful Absolutely. out of what you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's very nicely said. Um, use that to uh, point about business ethics to connect then to uh, the philosophy of education material we were talking please, about. So please. if we think about people's formative years, uh, if we say, well, we want to prepare people for a certain attitude that their their, their work lives can be beautiful, fulfilling, creative, and so on, and their lives right more broadly, then that means we really need to think seriously about how we educate children. Uh, it has some, I think, fairly profound implications for uh, uh, trying to change what we are currently doing. Because if you think of the stereotype, it's not really a stereotype because we all have experienced this about how a standard classroom, right, is is organized, right? It's straight rows of desks and the students go in and they have an assigned seat and they have to stay there, right, and not move. For right? 12 and, years. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the worst case scenario, right? And they have to, uh, you know, the teacher is standing up at the front as the authority figure, and she has all of the answers. And if she doesn't have the answer, it's in the textbook. And you do what the teacher tells you when you work on pre-assigned problems, and all of the students are doing the same problem at the same time in the same way, and they're all supposed to get the same answer, right? Um, That does not train people to think creatively. It doesn't train people to be independent. Uh, it doesn't train anything. It trains people to be robots. Um, and so if the lesson is, as many children do, that you know, school is a kind of dehumanizing place, and they first become disengaged, then they become bored, then it becomes actively painful, and they feel you know, that the only way they can express who they are is by teenage rebellion, right, by the time they get to that stage. You know, you've got to go with the kids on those kids. You know, they're struggling to retain their humanity in the context of a school system that, uh, to the extent that it follows that model, is uh, not only not preparing them for a fulfilling work life, not preparing them for a fulfilling life. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, sad to repulsive, depending on what degree of system you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And And... In, in, in your work on the, philosophy of, on the philosophy of education, where do you see the opportunities? And, and again, how do you bring Ayn Rand in, into this? Yeah. Because I, I'm, I'm imagining you, you get to work with your students. Right? And they, they come in with a certain set of expectations. Right? Your class is yet one more 
step on this journey of fulfilling this step-by-step process of getting to how do how do you attempt to reach them are, mm. are they open to ideas what what's what's your experience yeah. well uh <clears throat> i'd say overall good i still enjoy my teaching a great deal um but as you were pointing out there part of what i need to work uh on a lot with my students particularly the first year freshman students is to just this expectations issue because to a large extent they have had any sense of creative thinking uh, beaten out of them that's that's too strong but it has been uh, suppressed in them to the point where it's not an expectation right for them in at least in formal education i should say you know american culture is pretty good outside of school at fostering independence and creativity you know with all of the sports and music lessons and and so on. But inside the formal school system, students do learn. Yeah, you sit there, you do what the professor or the teacher tells you, you uh, you learn the material minimally to get through the <laughs> test, uh, right, and so on. So, uh, you know, right from the beginning, I do uh, confront that as nicely, right, as I, as I can. You know, so, in my class, I tell them nobody has to take philosophy and I always resist any movements in my department or at my, my uh, institution for making philosophy required courses. Because if students come in and they have to take the course, it's already right, one barrier right, that you have to overcome. So I uh, typically only get students who at some level have chosen right, to take the course. Uh, I tell you, you don't have to take this course. If it's not for you, then, then, then go, somewhere, go somewhere else. Um, uh, but you know, phrase that nicely. It's not uh, that I'm trying to kick them right out of the out of the class. I typically make all of the assignments um, optional, right, all the way through. So what I will do is I'll say, you know, for example, this semester at the end of the semester, you will send me an essay uh, in which you discuss all of the readings. You know, we do typically do one reading per week. Uh, you know, tell me what you think about these essays all the way through. But uh, every week, you, if you want, right, uh, you can send me 300 words right, on that topic and come and talk with me about those 300 words. Uh, but you don't have to if you don't want to. So the idea, again, is that you know, they don't have to do these assignments. If they are serious about learning, they will decide to do the assignments. Um, and again, getting away from that social model of just following like, the uh, following the order. Um, so some of them get it pretty quickly and they like it. I do typically have, uh, at least in my freshman classes, a, a, a quick drop rate of about 25% of the students who say, no, this is not what I want to do. Right? And, and they, uh, they, they will, when you debrief them, they'll say, no, I, I just want to know what I need to learn. And I want to have set assignments with set dates, and that's what I'm comfortable with. So, um, and I think that's uh, sad, but you know, they know themselves well enough that so that's not going to be the course for them. Um, if one uh, you know, tries to play the authoritarian teacher and tell them what to do and what the right answers are, that's not good education anyway. So. It's uh, a little bit hopeless at that point. So I would say, in one way, I'm in a very fortunate situation. So the students who do take philosophy and stay with it, you know, they tend to be students who actually are interested in thinking about the issues and getting some feedback. So it works out well. Excellent. Well, and and in service of your students, in service of you um, continuing to teach, and I know you have other responsibilities to attend to. Um, thank you so much for the conversation. It's it's always a pleasure to be in your mind and, and hear your thoughts. And thank you. It was for, a pleasure. Very yeah, very good questions and uh, yeah, a lot of your thoughts were very well formulated. I enjoyed listening. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Well, so right. I look forward to seeing you at future conferences. And otherwise, have an excellent day. Thank you, and <laughs> in, you too. In the name of the best within us. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye for now, Mark. The Becoming an Ayn Rand Hero podcast is sponsored by the composer Darren John Lewis, whose music I use for this podcast. If you'd like a custom choral or symphonic piece for your special event or celebration, or if you'd just like to hear more of his music, go to darrenjohnlewis.com. That's D-A-R-I-N 
J-O-H-N-L-E-W-I-S dot com. Thank you. And see you in the next episode of Becoming an Ayn Rand Hero.